Mark Mulk, who is now going to take the floor. Mark was born in Marseille in 1972. He lives and works in Paris. And uh, uh, as we shall very uh, quickly see, he is both a painter and a writer. And we see in his work how these two disciplines uh, uh, respond to each other in a play between fiction and autobiography. From a pictorial point of view, the principles of his technique uh, imply uh, staging various stages in painting from grey to water. And uh, But as Mark is going to explain, each painting for him is painted uh, for someone specific who has its own story. Mark has published several books, in particular, The Disappearance of the Real World, a magnificent uh, book, and is recently published, uh, Ben La Vue, La Peinture à Regarder, uh, fully, you know, painting to be seen, fully in your eye. And uh, he is going to give us his uh, personal appraisal of the love for painting and I think this love for painting is something that we shall be immediately uh, hearing. So Mark, the floor is yours now to uh, give us your s sentimental feeling. I love you. I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Love is wonderful. But saying, I love you, isn't the same thing as knowing how to make love. To make love, you need to be excited, of course, but you also need technical know-how and experience, bodily experience, self-experience, and experience of bearing oneself in the shifting, inventive, and domineering continuum of desire. And you don't make love on your own. We might talk of a kind of capricious grace, the grace of Kairos, the grace that underpins all moments we treasure most. It's a bit of an old chestnut, but paintings are a lot like love, and painting is a lot like making love. Painting is a practical knowledge. It arises from desire. It profits from its experience and builds up its technical expertise. It throws itself then into a daunting, intoxicating, and ever-changing performance. Gesture is key here, but only when the gesture is perfect. Only when it is perfectly attuned to the perfectly chosen moment and only when it miraculously adapts to the moment by reinventing itself rather than carrying out a chore. But who do you make love to when you paint? Who do you join in the bend of painting? There's no one in the studio. I'm on my own. Painting often requires retreat, a retreat into oneself and radical, rather trying isolations. You have to imagine the life of a painter of what it is, a tunnel of active meditation in which, in my experience, the only eyes you see are the eyes you are painting. The only voice you hear is your own voice talking out aloud to the canvas or to another, poor self. The person who missed up in this detail here but pulled off an unplanned effect here. Your emotional reactions run the gamut from the overtop rebukes to the health sec congratulations, from insults to the triumphant yes, and you can find yourself playing the madman in front of an absent audience. When suffering this self-imposed solitary confinement, it can be wise to shut in everyone else as well, your friends, sweethearts, worries, fantasies and regrets. And in this incessant to and fro between everyday life and the petrified life of paintings, there is a very particular sequence of events at work, both invasive and concealed, and naive and sophisticated. I like to call it a sentimental reason. It impacts on every stage in the making of the painting and the use of otherwise procedural techniques. To describe the role of this discrete magnetism, I want to talk to you about Eloise, Jerome, Claire, Lionel, Ayako, Guillaume, Brune and Enguerrand, Sarah, Pierre-Yves, Aude, Philippe, Jesus, Fanfan, Jen, Kimiko and Jean-Michel, and Anne, and myself. But first, I'm going to talk to you about Jean-Yves and Ophélie. It was Jean-Yves who introduced me to Ophélie. 
We were talking, and I was telling how I placed my paintings horizontally on the floor and covered them with colored pieces and juices. And to start with, the purpose of these juices was simply to add color to my paintings, which often initially in black and white. Nowadays, I'd say they also create a kind of confusion or fusion, something which I foolishly shied away from from a long time. I prepared watery or terp-based juices in two-liter plastic bottles and poured them on the half-painted gray skull canvases I placed on the floor. I told Jean-Yves how I splash or tilt the canvases or spatter them with solids like earth, seeds, uh, lentils, rice or beans. And then I stand there waiting for the juice to dry. I myself call this juice supervision because sometimes the juices go wrong. Cunningly, surreptitiously, their morphology totally changes and occasionally unexpected, disgraceful puddles form in the center of the canvas. To prevent such infelicities, I often sellotape Bon Maman jam jar lids at various points between the frame and the back of the canvas before laying it out horizontally. Sometimes I also dot various objects on the floor, making the surface of the canvas slightly uneven when it's placed on top. This sundry paraphernalia creates discrete and varied promontories along the surface of the painting, and this can completely change the dynamics of the fluid. The seeds scattered in the juice also have a special effect. The diluted pigments accumulate around them by capillary action, and when the juice is dry and I stand the canvas upright, the seeds fall to the floor and leave delicate splash-like pockmarks on the surface of the painting. So, there I was talking about my work and my hope of instilling my paintings with a great sense of melancholy. Uh, I mean, the kind of melancholy you get with any old coloured photograph, I think namely of uh, Felice Beato, among others, or from children's drawings left out in the rain. And at this point, Jean-Yves pointed out to me how many recumbent or lifeless figures I'd painted. As a little early on, we had mentioned Ophelia by John Everett uh, Millier as a masterpiece of romantic painting. He made a link between the drowned Ophelia and my predilection for using juice in my work. In each of my horizontal paintings, he could see a both mythological and purely technical repetition of the Ophelian drama. And on that day, Ophelia officially entered my life. I understood what I was doing better. I painted women, men, strangers, and loved ones, and then I drowned them. I'd been right to convite in Jaive to go into the details, vacillations, and intimacy of my painting. But, actually, my use of paint in liquid form arose out of something else, too, out of a concern for realism imprinted with reality. I had been very impressed by Eve Klein's concept of rain paintings made by fixing black canvases to the roof of his car before driving from Paris to Marseille in gloomy weather. Uh, I picked up this idea of painting the elements on my own art. I make paintings of water, air and earth. For the air, I use an airbrush and ready-made spray paint, which produce beautifully soft dispersal effects. The earth is there when I pour out the juice or use raw pigments and I spread out water in an almost fluvial way. This water is powerful. It gives the paintings a realistic basis in that they become recording plaques or plates for countless random accidents. Viewed from a certain distance, there always seems to be a logic behind the organization which would be hard-pressed to describe in plain language, but which is, let's say, the logic of water, the logic of reality in its movement, and therefore independent of my will. Reality enters into my paintings, not through illusionist reproductions, but through these stupefying watermarks. Gravity paints itself. The hydraulic distribution of the pigments acts of its own accord. And though I may control the general conditions when applying the juice, I have a hard time predicting where this shelf of black granules or that sheet of golden powder will wash up. I now want to talk about Fanfan. Fanfan is the person I turned to when I had problems with iridescent flakes imported from Germany. The flakes measured less than 20 microns and just flew away when I opened the lid of the jar. Wearing a special mask to avoid contracting silicosis in a year's time, I would quickly throw the flakes in clumps on the freshly poured juice. 
I still do sometimes, and I like their extreme delicacy, the way they discreetly mix with anything and everything swept along by the juice. I also wanted to try out bigger flakes, though I struggled to find what I was looking for. Let me explain my reasoning to you. I found the lingering trace of the canvas in my painting, the way the weft was left exposed after the juice had evaporated, somehow too crude or brutal and rough and ready. Adding gold, silver and flakes to the juice gave the sometimes overly earthy or impure text of, of my paintings a paradoxically precious touch, something which is lost in reproductions. In my bid to instill my juice douse paintings with a sense of melancholy, I would have lapsed into the poignancy if I hadn't introduced these pearl-like effects. By painting brown ochres that shone when looked at from certain angles, I tried to render that special indulgence we all feel for things that make us sad. Fanfan is a very technical, and she told me about flakes of coloured glass that were fine, weighty, solid-looking in light, ambiguously sparkling, and lacking the childish uniformity of big plastic flakes. Glass is one of the few truly magical materials on Earth. What I mean is that glass, like wood, gold or sugar, is beautiful in all its forms, regardless of whatever processing it is subjected to. So we talked about minerals, iron and quartz, and the waitress in the recent, I couldn't help notice, took us for a pair of cranks. Whenever I hit upon a problem with varnish, cracking surfaces or inexplicable sunken paint, Fun Fun always has a solution at her fingertips, always laughs at my misguided ways, even though I'm an old pro too. I want to linger a moment on the notion of texture because in painting, images have a skin-like surface. I could talk about wonder here, but I won't. Ultimately, a technique either arouses a desire to touch the canvas or it doesn't. It's subjective, but to my mind, a painting I don't want to touch is a failure. There is an eroticism of technique that unfolds in the act of painting, in its ca caresses, stickiness and finger play. Each practice comes with its own kind of sensuality, but the culmination of this eroticism of technique depends on whether the skin of a painting is an emotionally charged surface. Let me be clear. This potential is latent in any texture. Everything depends on the organic quality of the painting as a whole. This is not an apologia for smooth surfaces. Rough, blustery, chapped and matte surfaces can be just as sublime. For my part, my work develops out of my coloured juices, out of a geography of textures whose frictions and granularities and oil impastos hopefully liberate the craftsmanship of my paintings from any one formula. It may not be about variety for variety's sake, but still, I've never resolved to paint scruffy hair. I've seen it done well by others, but even if I ignore my own extrapolation of the finished painting's texture, there are certain sensory pleasures I need when I'm painting. It's worth briefly returning here to the eroticism of technique. I get real pleasure using my brush to create fur-like effects on the half-dried surface of a painting. Like a smiling blind man wrung his fingers curiously across bry, I enjoy endlessly patting the surface of my paintings to make sure the clumps of little granules are firmly stuck to them. For me, every painting is a bit like a sandpit. Though the whole process is often very trying and one violates oneself in painting because one has to, a series of sensuous rendezvous have nonetheless occurred. These are, are crucial uh, to a process that in many ways is slightly masochistic and cannot go on if it causes only pain. It's now talk to you about Kimiko, Jean-Michel, Jerome and a few others. In A Lover's Discourse Fragments, uh, Roland Barth writes that whenever we express our views about love, however theoretical they may be, we're always secretly addressing them to someone. Whatever people may say, a comment about love is always allocutory. The same is true when I'm painting. Many of my paintings have an ideal spectator, a more or less secret recipient, the painting's raison d'etre, if you like. This recipient might be the model of the painting or not. The two scenarios are pulled apart. It's very unlikely that the recipient will later own the painting and the lucky owner may not even be aware of his or her existence. 
to be specific, and since the expression allocutory discourse is inappropriate in painting, I prefer to talk of a dedicatory device. This assumes that the different aspects of the painting, the colors and effects used, the meaning, indeed the painting as a whole, all come together to form a dedicatory work, a kind of pictorial dedication, and these might be a sign of my affection or esteem for the recipient, or sometimes a way to preserve the memory of a lengthy discussion or a sunny afternoon. It would be unthinkable to let such memory slip away. People have colors. Kimiko will always be pink and white for me. Jean-Michel, yellow. Jerome, beige and khaki. Try giving a color to your close friends and family, and you'll realize just how few options there are. When Kimiko comes back from Japan, she brings samurai costumes for my children. Jean-Michel is obsessed with the notion of reflection, and in many ways Jerome has something in common with Proust. Well, one mustn't succumb to crude illusions, of course. How could I ignore these signs when I'm painting these models or painting for them? It would be absurd to drown Kimiko in the same stream as Jerome. Messy brushstrokes in a painting for Kimiko would be like bad manners. Failing to capture Jerome's cosy elegance would amount to er errant misinterpretation. It's hard to imagine the dizzying responsibility you feel when the feel when the recipient also models for the painting, when you paint the face of a person who's trusted you to paint him, who will know if you've got it wrong or given it to embellishment. It's also hard to imagine the extent to which the painting, which is destined to become something of a lifelong magic mirror, can jeopardize the intimate foundations of the relationship. For a painter, this drug drill between feverish composition and precautionary calm is a very acme of difficulty. Choosing a model, one model in particular, is a relatively mysterious process. Sometimes I feel as though it's the product of a proprietary reflex or sense of gratitude. Other times, I think it's a way for me to mythologize a special relationship. Filming or taking photographs of each other is one thing. Painting is quite another. I don't know why. One thing for sure, choosing to paint someone means condemning yourself to spend a long time in that person's absence. Much more time than you would during an evening out with friends or even a holiday in Brittany. And the person knows it. The model, by accepting to pose for a painting, somehow authorizes the painter to talk to her silent face and motionless body. The model leaves the painter with an abstract, incredibly fragile version of herself. When you return from this long journey, and if the painting works and is truthful, everything has changed. Despite the best intentions and precautions in the world, and despite the affection you may feel for your model, accidents can happen. In a burst of impatience, you rewalk a, or rework a layer of paint too hastily. In a moment of drumsiness uh, and clumsiness, you spare a cheek with Mars black, and to your surprise, the pigment sinks in without warning, though you had no trouble wiping it off a million times before. In a flash of vanity, you recklessly try out an irreversible technique, convinced that, well, sometimes you should go a bit wild, and that you're being bold, and that everything will turn out fine. But it's a car crash. And I see in that a series of terrible, enraged, desperate cries resounding throughout the studio. Several solutions are available to the crash victim, all of which imply an ethics of error. I won't list all the schools of thought, but simply describe how I personally react to disasters. Curiously, it was my parents who gave me my most important lesson in painting a long time ago and in a completely different context. My father pointed out that tripping up doesn't matter in itself, providing you get back on an even footing afterwards. But by drawing my attention to the step after stumble, he wanted to teach me how to ask for forgiveness. And whether she suspected mischief, my mother, whose hobby horse was always knowing everything, used to repeat to me, a fault confessed is a fault redressed. It was a principle she always respected, sometimes by dint of remarkable self-control. So I grew up with this double certainty that anything can be forgiven if you own up to your own mistakes. 
After a pictorial crash and an incompressible half hour of terror and self-flagellation, I go into remorse mode. I mean genuine remorse, one that will redeem me as a painter and do more than restore the appearance of the painting. Why more than restore? Because it's always like that. The accident disturbs everything and unexpectedly plunges you into the beating heart of the painting, producing astonishing mental acrobatics that would be unthinkable in more pedestrian circumstances. I was sure of myself when I used a spray paint canister to pulverize peacock eye feathers onto Eloise's pyjamas in the painting Mimosa Island. I was convinced of the punk appeal of this move. When I realized I'd made a mistake, I used turpentine to remove the spots of acrylic paint that were drying in less than five minutes and I quite simply blowtorched half the painting, including Eloise, though I failed to get everything off. The sight of this tundra, where just an hour before there stood a perfectly credible Eloise, brought on a bout of self-loathing and scorn of rare purity. A week later, an intuition put an end to my ordeal. From the very start, I'd wanted Eloise to stab herself a la Lucretia, so why not set her alight while I was at it? I understood what the accident had been telling me. The orange surface was an appeal for fire, to set her on fire, to paint fire. The brush with disaster had added accidental conflagration to the initial seppuku. By heightening the murderous and originally over-timid intentions of the painting, the accident had multiplied its meanings. I mention this to show that nothing is ever lost. Therefore, it is a message of hope. And while we are discussing the arcana of positive thinking, I should mention Françoise Hardy, Léo Ferry and Franz Schubert. In other words, of course, I'm talking about music. It's the best way to immerse yourself in what you're doing and float away. It produces a kind of nebulous concentration. Some types of music are essential to some types of painting. Every technique has its own soundtrack. It would never occur to me to start a piece of painstaking work without distracting myself with some chanson française. I can drift away. In doing so, the boredom I might have felt, and which despite myself would have left its mark on the painting, also drifts away. Before a spell of brisk and risky painting, on the contrary, I warm up for a good half hour with Hungry Heart by Bruce Springsteen. That gives me enough energy to wrestle with my work, sometimes literally. I'm sure my musical tastes are ripe for criticism, but I'm not talking about the latest music here, rather about that secret music we've carried around with us forever, ever since that disco in the garage where we were kissed for the first time. Who among us couldn't name three or four songs that brings tears to the eyes? Nothing is better than music when it comes to reconnecting with your emotions in the studio. You have to extricate yourself from your everyday concerns. What's more, you yourself are the first tool. I've heard that some animals use tools, but the humans are the only ones who use tools to make other tools. If I make my own contribution here, I'd say that there's a lot to be gained from considering ourselves as tools, tools that can be handled, blunted or sharpened in various ways. For a, a painter achieving that vital synchronization with the emotional currents in his current painting is not necessarily straightforward nor quick. Rather than waiting a few year, hours or for the right day when my feelings chime with those in the painting, I put on a few carefully chosen compilations which stir up my emotions just how they need to be. And, last but not least, music lets me float away. Schubert, Chopin, Debussy provide sharp spikes of concentration which carry me through the painting process through sheer dogged determination or carry me away with the work itself. These spikes are harmful and dangerous. They can lead you into mindless concentration, the kind where you end up absentmindedly sticking out your tongue, toil, basically. My friends know how important the notion of sprezzatura is to me. This is an Italian word describing a certain casualness one can nurture in one's conversation or paintings. 
It's about preserving an easy, natural exterior that hides the difficulties inherent in artifice and deludes people into thinking that everything is done effortlessly, almost without thinking. It's an ideal. Sometimes a little technical swagger is welcome, but most of the time I aim for a kind of ben fatto ma fe presto, which is impossible to achieve if you're not more or less in the right frame of mind. Music makes the soul malleable. When there is music, the paintbrush dances across the canvas. You get through your troubles with your thoughts elsewhere and without playing the solemn artisan. Painting has everything to gain from listening to music. Du holst der Kunst, ich danke dir dafür. This is where Claire, Ayako and Lionel come in. For some time, I'd been toying with the idea of an alternative version of Caravaggio's Judith beheading Holofernes, and they were my models, but the painting remains unfinished. An unfinished painting is testimony to the order in which it was painted. In my experience, it's up to me to figure out what that order is rather than dictate it to the painting, and in this sense, as in so many others, Painting is like a permanent headache or a long, highly meditated strategic game in which the anxiety of accident and the nonchalance of sprezzatura are par for the course. When I use the term order, I don't mean that the painting is completed in an order set out by a given protocol. I mean an order prompted by the painting itself and which moves me to paint this or that element first. And the second kind of order invariably sends the first into singular disarray. What's more, the order reshuffles as the painting progresses. The process of deliberate reflection presiding over this nebula of tactical decisions takes more time than the painting itself. Uh, and you have to... Uh, pay attention to your intuitions. You have to let them mature until you obtain a semblance of certainty, one that will survive once the intuition becomes reality, and that takes time. I'd like to be able to reproduce the anxious internal monologue that precedes every moment and movement of my hands, but I've come to the conclusion it's impossible. My out loud discussion with myself might go something like this. Should I paint Claire's front forearm an orangey colour? No. Too obvious. Or should I rework the blade of the Malaysian Chris in Lionel Sand? But in that case, I'll lose the blurriness in that area. I know what I want to paint Claire's tongue fuchsia pink and her eyes turquoise blue, but I'll go back to her face at the end. That's what the Renaissance masters recommended. It's better to add the finishing touches bit by bit, else you end up changing the colour of the sky half a dozen times. Anyway, you get the picture. These conjectures can go on for hours, even days. Sometimes they only stop when audacity mutinies, and I do something aimless and clumsy, simply to snap myself out of the dream of painting by painting. And this is when major accidents and or miracles occur and your grey matter has no choice but to return to square one. I could have declared the painting finished several times already. It's fine as it is, it works, I like it. But I haven't finished with it yet. Our business with each other hasn't run its course. We haven't argued and made up enough. And I'm too old for casual flings. Sometimes I add a final misjudged touch to the canvas and lay down the first fateful cornerstone of a new composition. Over time, the result is an almost manic depressive scenic wave of uh, successive achievements and reckless false moves. Finishing the painting is of course essential, but it often occurs simply because I give up. The painting closes itself off from me and forbids all further surgical intervention. It leaves me for good and stands there in front of me without any corresponding realisation on my part as to how I painted it. When my reaction to a painting is one of fetishistic caution, I'm unable to make any further changes. As I give the painting its final gloss, I come to terms with our separation. Over time, this mindset instills a sensitivity to technique. People who paint generally become unwitting spies when they look at a painting. They speculate about the methods employed to paint this or that effect, or about the amount of resin in the medium, the type of tool used, and so on and so forth. It's like rewinding a film, and this process of reconstruction can become very involved when it develops into a group discussion about the painting. 
It's not an autopsy, because the endeavour is always triggered by a genuine aesthetic response. If you'll excuse me, a little priggishness here, I'd say that retrospective curiosity nurtures my technical sensibility just as much as the more or less successful results of my experiments in the studio. It's worth pointing out that some techniques are like magic tricks. They hint at their secrets, but are impervious to mental dissection. You always get to the bottom of things in the end. It just requires perseverance and research. Curiously, though, you maintain a special respect for this secretiveness. The opposite is actually also true. I'm talking about those quite straightforward paintings created without bells and whistles or laser swords, but which swallow up your soul and latch onto you like your first romance. Looking at paintings is already a form of painting. The obsession with mentally taking things apart is not confined to the workshop or the studio. For example, I remember being particularly struck by several paintings by Oda representing women's flowing hair. I was surprised by the expressiveness of the brush strokes she had used in the hair. From the width of the strokes, I could infer the brush size she had used. From the silky and finey grooves, I could guess the type of bristle. And I could also guess the blend of linseed oil and secative to Harlem that she had mixed with them to the colours. What I needed was the knack. And that required a few trials and errors and a good warm-up session listening to the Beach Boys or Wagner, or something in between. Months later, I still had those images of flowing hair in my mind when I painted the red wig in the painting Gender Theory. It wasn't the same kind of hair, I wasn't aiming for the same delicacy, and I wasn't using the same kind of brush. But the seed planted by my speculations about Oda's flowing hair was there in shadow form as I painted. In this overview of my relationship to technique, as of painting as practice, I want to conclude by saying a word about expression. Many people equate prowess with virtuosity, and they aren't wrong. Excellence in one's area of expertise is a marvellous thing. I would love to be able to paint trinkets in two shakes of a lamb's tail, and I'd give my horse to set foot in the kingdom of perfect, problem-free painting. But, in my opinion, there is a more enviable form of prowess, one that is perhaps just as unattainable. I would call this form of visual eloquence imperfect, clear expression. Yet this prowess, arguably, has a technical side too. Different methods, gestures and tools do not simply shape matter in different ways. Each technique expresses one set of sentiments rather than another. Sweeping and expressive strokes will always be more direct and immediate, representing strength, speed and a form of freedom. Shading expresses nuance and gradual progress, and that is in no way an accident. Shading expresses these things because it required nuance and gradual work from the painter, and the cerebral coldness of many geometric paintings is the byproduct of the machine-like techniques used to create the distinct and repetitive shapes. Quite independently of the painter, each technique naturally arouses a certain kind of emotion contained within it. There are no neutral feelings when it comes to technique. Of course, you don't have to take whatever a technique spontaneously expresses at face value. A painter can pervert these mechanisms and make a technique say something it has never said before, or quite simply the opposite of what it automatically says. When a technique is given over to its own expressivity, its intrinsic sentiments unfold without supervision. The technique is then a device. When a painter masters a technique, not only because he or she handles it with dexterity, but also because it is subordinated to a human goal, to an emotion other than its own, i.e. the painter's, this creates a virtuous cycle that makes clear expression possible. That is a grand ambition, but one worth describing. The road is long. I'd very much like to find a set of techniques that would allow me to more accurately and soberly express the sad side to my temperament, the general melancholy I feel. But the task is complex and prey to contradictory misgivings. And the painter plays the orchestral conductor with varying degrees of success, but he doesn't really know why one painting has been lucky and successful, nor is he able to isolate it and continue in this energetic plan. 
I know I've made progress these past few years. I've acknowledged the supremacy of liquid effects and the importance of leaving a degree of confusion in my painting. I have abandoned my aim of painting all the colors of the rainbow in every single canvas. In doing so, I've recognized the structural incompatibility that exists between the play on color saturation and the banks of my art. I still advance warily, however, hoping to much more finely capture emotional disorder and ambivalence in my painting. The years fly by in slow motion. They die and disappear in the blink of an eye. Where does it come from? This sense of playing the boxer, and to top it all off, a boxer whose punch bag is a beef carcass by Rembrandt. You will have noticed that I haven't talked about all the people I mentioned in my introduction, and even less about those I didn't mention at all. It simply wasn't possible in the time available. I could have talked about my sister Anne, whom I haven't seen for a long time, and to improvise the art critic when I first started painting. I could have talked about many friend and colleague, Eve, for example, who often says that yellow ochre is the bread of painters, and the subtle Nazanin, who had me in stitches when we were in residency together. More to the point, I could have mentioned all the people with whom I've never discussed painting, but who have nevertheless taught me how to paint quite simply because they've taught me how to live. Céline was right to urge modesty when she saw me showing off in front of friends. In the studio, I whitened some of my garish colors. Leila, who talks philosophy on the beach, convinced me that providence really does exist. In the months following our conversation, I took on board what she said and paid attention to all the unpredictable undercurrents in my painting. At a noisy party, Martin extolled the virtues of hard work during the writing process. Afterwards, I made a conscious effort to spend twice as much time in my studio. On the other hand, painting has taught me a lot too. When a single detail transforms the meaning of a painting as a whole, you step out onto the street knowing full well that holding your partner's hand is enough to liven up 20 years of living together. If despite your best efforts, a lovely looking juice turns out ugly when it's dried, you end up feeling less disheartened about promises in general. When a painting you dismissed as a failure two years ago suddenly seems essential to all your current work, you no longer give such self-confident advice to your friends. Life can be studied in paintings, and painting is perfected in life. Sentimental reason imposes a degree of order on this teeming, capricious, chaotic mass. It makes light of everything we hold dear. We forget that the most gorgeous seashells are home to sticky but contented anthropods. And likewise, when people look at my paintings, they probably, but shouldn't, forget how happy and naive, in short, how alive I was. Thank you.